Hello all and welcome to uh, this uh, session of our conference. My name is David Gibson and I'm the director of the Center on Religion and Culture at Fordham University. I'm the moderator for this session. Our title is Culture First, Shaping a Culture of Peace Building Through Spirituality in the Catholic Tradition. Now, by way of background, this is the first time that Fordham has been a direct participant and co-sponsor of this annual conference organized by our friends at the Catholic Peace Building Network. And we could really not be more pleased to be taking part. And we trust this is the start of a long-term partnership for us. We also recognize, as previous speakers have noted uh, already, that the timing could not be more urgent given all that is going on in the world today, uh, and so much of it not good. Hence the title of the conference itself, Catholic Peace Building in Times of Crisis, Hope for a Wounded World. Our discussion right now, as the title says, will focus on the culture first approach to peace building, shaping a culture of peace building through spirituality in the Catholic tradition. Now we have two terrific speakers, both of whom I consider personal friends and both of whom I admire so much professionally. First, we have uh, my Fordham colleague, Father Tom Massaro, a, a professor of moral theology at Fordham. He's also taught at Weston Jesuit School of Theology in Cambridge, Massachusetts at Boston College and at the Jesuit School of Theology at Santa Clara University, where he also served as Dean. Tom's nine books and over 100 published articles treat Catholic social teaching and its recommendations for public policies oriented to social justice, peace, worker rights, and poverty alleviation. His most recent book is Mercy in Action, The Social Teachings of Pope Francis. We're also joined by um, a Fordham grad, Megan Clark. She's an associate professor of moral theology at St. John's University here in New York. She's a senior fellow of the Vincentian Center for Church and Society. She serves as a faculty expert for the Holy See's mission to the United Nations. And Meg is on, on the faculty advisory board for Catholic Relief Services. Um, CRS's University Initiative for University Engagement. In 2015, Megan was a Fulbright Scholar to the Hakima Institute for Peace Studies and International Relations in Nairobi, Kenya. She is author of The Vision of Catholic Social Thought. She was also recently cited by Cardinal Blaise Supich in his latest column for uh, Chicago Catholic. Um, welcome to you both. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to, in a minute, just in a minute, uh, to Father Tom to offer some um, brief thoughts to get us going, and then Meg will add in a couple of her thoughts. Then we'll open the discussion up for conversation. We really hope very much that you all online will speak up, and you can do that by raising your hand with the raise your hand function on Zoom. I'm sure we're all familiar with that by now. <laughs> So it goes. I'd also ask that maybe you pop your name into the chat box at the same time so that I can more easily keep track of the order of questions. I'll call on you, ask you to unmute your microphone. Then once you have asked your question of Father Tom or, or Meg Clark, please mute yourself again so that we know, don't get any unnecessary background noise. Okay, enough housekeeping. Let's turn it over to Father Tom Massaro. Father Tom. Thank you very much, David. And I'll just speak for about three minutes to set the tone. And if you listen closely, you'll hear a series of questions embedded in my three minutes of uh, introduction here. So as David said, we at Fordham are especially pleased to be sponsoring this event and especially so early in this important international conference. When we planned out our theme, we had very much at the front of mind, the three assumptions behind this conference. One, that a theology of hope matters. Two, that peace building matters. And three, more specifically, that Catholic peace building matters. We're very impressed by those parts of the conference program that so evidently tap the abundant expertise of world-class experts on such topics as the institutional networks, 
to enhance global security and practical strategies for dis disarmament and peace building. We look forward to those sessions where such brass tax considerations will shed abundant light on the path forward. But we are also eager to highlight the value of some perhaps softer themes and topics that felicitously complement those harder or practical considerations. So in this session, which we have framed as a discussion format by way of a genre, we seek simply to provide space to invite wide ranging conversations regarding the personal and cultural task of disarming hearts. As you may have seen in the program uh, session description, we are convinced that only a genuine conversion of individual hearts and writ larger, a conversion of entire cultures will provide a stable basis for lasting peace. Such high-minded aspirations remain mere idle dreams in the absence of some tangible resources that establish a basis for our hopes for peace building. Fortunately, the Catholic tradition features rich spiritual and cultural resources that nourish these hopes. The subtitle of our session today captures these insights in a nutshell. It reads, shaping a culture of peace building through spirituality in the Catholic tradition. We would love to hear from all of our participants today what you understand to be promising elements of Roman Catholicism, past and present, that support and favor these purposes. Now, definitions of culture can be maddeningly vague, but the best ones refer to an ensemble of beliefs and practices that express key dimensions of the life of a people. So here's a question. Can you identify any particular decisive doctrinal affirmations or tenets of the Catholic faith that support peace and support strenuous efforts at peace building that are required to make effective our aspirations to reduce conflict in the world? Just as important as religious doctrines are practices that enact our faith, and we would love to hear from you about how you view the role of prayer in all its wondrous variety as sustaining and inspiring efforts to advance peace. So here's a question. Have you witnessed specific practices of prayer, public or private, that seem to succeed in forming the more peaceful, uh, forming more peaceful people and communities. And besides prayer, are there any spiritual practices that you would recommend for developing interior dispositions favoring peace and that express the priority, indeed the urgency of peace building? And not to be overlooked here is the role of the arts in advancing a peaceful perspective on our suffering world. The visual, graphic and performing arts, including film, literature, and poetry, are all critical elements of any culture, and especially a culture opened to peace building. In your eyes, here's a question, what works in sparking the collective human imagination to support peace? What artistic contributions have perhaps moved the needle to change cultures in the past? What aesthetic initiatives hold special promise to foster bold and constructive transformations in the future as we face new challenges to peace? So as a Jesuit university, we Fordham folks are deliberately invoking the motif of transformation, of a conversion of hearts and cultures that is so thoroughly Ignatian in its spiritual foundation. We are keenly interested in identifying and promoting a wide range of spiritual elements and practices that might enhance the kind of conversation that might transform the world into a place of enhanced peaceableness. We don't fully understand how to pull this off, of course, but perhaps your kind participation over the next hour can provide some guidance as we stoke our imaginations together. All of your insights, no matter how modest sounding, are most welcome today. And Megan, would you like to add anything to that? Thank you, Tom. 
Um, so I'm going to throw out one um, one example of what of what something might look like when it is is actively building a culture of peace in a particularly Catholic context. And some of you who are are here with us today may have spent some time at Hakima, and you may have had experiences of um, the Jesuit School of Theology and the Institute for Peace Studies in Nairobi, Kenya. So I was there in 2015, and um, at Hakima, Wednesday is call it is is when the college comes together at noon to have mass before lunch. And so all of the Jesuits in formation, all of the peace students, everyone who's currently studying at the, the college and all its programs would come together for Wednesday liturgy. And the thing about Mass at Hakima um, is when I first got there, it absolutely terrified me. And it terrified me because all of every song was in a different language. And my students and the students throughout Hakima came from all over, mostly Eastern and Central Africa, but including um, somebody I taught there is, is now helping at the Ukraine-Polish border. He, he was a, a Polish a Jesuit, um, including people from other places. And I was getting challenged because I wasn't singing. And again, these were all languages. Mass was in English, but all, you know, I, I could sing the French and I understood a little bit of the Latin, but I didn't the six, seven other languages that would be it sung and invoked. And then I realized that nobody in the choir singing knew what all of the words meant to all the songs, that most of the people singing around me didn't know all of the, the languages that were being used in this liturgy and yet and yet they understood and yet they were one community uh, coming together through prayer oftentimes from places where there were deep-seated conflicts and conflicts between countries historically um, and for me that became an image of pentecost and, and so as we start out and we think about what provokes our imagination and what can convert our hearts and our culture, I throw that out as an example of thinking through that, that peace, building a culture of peace um, is maybe what Pentecost had in mind. And maybe there are examples from all of our communities of where when that happens, when we come together in prayer, um, it isn't just fleeting, but we get a glimpse of what that Pentecost vision of being one community in peace might look like. Meg, thank you so much. And thank you, Father Tom. And again, I just remind our participants, please uh, uh, weigh in at any point, use the raise your hand function or um, post uh, questions in the, in the chat uh, at the side for, um, for Meg Clark and Father Tom Massaro. One thing I just wanted to throw out there, I mean, what you're talking about seems, uh, and I'm wondering if this is the motif of peace building uh, in this era. Um, you know, Pope Francis the other day gave a, gave a lengthy, wide ranging talk to editors of Jesuit journals. It's really worth, um, worth checking out. And he said, uh, at, at one point he said, again, the world is at war. And he, he mentioned that a few years ago, it occurred to him to say that we're living in a third world war, piecemeal third world war. He said, for me today, World War III has been declared. This is something that should give us pause for thought. What is happening to humanity that we have had three world wars in a century? And I think that is so, you know, from his point of view, uh, you know, and his global point of view and Cardinal Bo earlier today, really seem to you know take a tour to, of the horizon to to kind of reflect on that but pope francis has also spoken about peacemaking in this post cold world war age as post ideological age as, as a kind of artisanal uh uh, uh metier and art, uh, it's peacemaking person by person is that really how peacemaking peace building happens in today's world these kind of personal one-to-one -one interactions is that really what we're what we should be looking for for signs of hope 
Tom, I'll, I'll, I'll pitch it to you or Megan, Meg, you go first. So, I mean, if it doesn't, if it doesn't start there, then it's peace isn't possible. Um, right. Like if, if it isn't pers one to one, it becomes nearly impossible to build right the communal peace and up and up and up that that would really lead to a culture of peace. Um, because at the end of the day, even in those bigger conflicts, what stops um, what stops conflict is is when people decide they will not participate in it anymore um, on some level. And the, you know, the places where there may have been some violence, but things didn't turn into um, conflict, it's because there was this sense of those who had the power to escalate or to, to um, use violence against civilians didn't. Um, and part of that comes from, there's a, there's a bit in Amoris Letizia where, where Pope Francis links together violence, domestic violence with violent conflict in society. And, and I, think, I think that's part of what he's talking about when he says it's person to person. Um, because if I don't see my neighbor as equally a child of God, then it's really hard to see someone on the other side of the world who I'll never meet and encounter as another child of God. Father Tom, do you have any thoughts? Uh, I have one word. I'll, I'll expand on it. The word is utopianism, and it gets mm -hmm. a bad name, but I've always been interested in utopian thought. So um, religion in general, and certainly Catholicism, with its emphasis on those three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love, is a locus where people can kind of kindle their hopes and not give up uh, or give in to a fatalistic vision. And I think that is a prerequisite for really imagining a peace that obviously is not being achieved now, but we can kindle hope that it could be sometime in the future. Thank you. I want to go to our first question, Olivia Dean. You can unmute. Yes, um, I wanted to ask you if you think that the addition of applying Catholic tradition to the conversation is important, nourishing hope, because faith is um, faith in a higher power can be very strong, fundamental tie to people's lives, and I think that really contributes to the systematic changes that people see and can relate to each other and. Like you were saying, um, see children um, as see each other as a child of God because it's really hard to connect with others that are so different from us. So I think having that collective unison of one creator is something that's really important. Thanks, uh, Tom. Do you want to go? Well, that's just a really good insight. And by the way, I'm delighted Olivia is one of my students here at Fordham and is a, a rising junior. Uh, so that comment uh, uh, comes out of her, um, uh, I know her, her uh, extensive work in uh, various fields, but it also captures something about the, the word, so another word I want to emphasize, solidarity. Uh, we have something in common with everybody. We're not so different from people in other cultures and other parts of the world. And I, I hear, Olivia, your comment coming out of maybe a striving or a union, yearning for us to see in the other a sense of solidarity. I, that's what I'm hearing when I hear that question. Solidarity, and I hope someone mentions the Fratelli Tutti um, encyclical at some point, because I'd like to get into that. I'm gonna go to Eduardo Gutierrez, and then after that, Bob Driver Bishop. Uh, Eduardo, could you unmute and ask a question? Yes. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. OK, I'm trying to unmute, turn my camera on, and then lower my hand. It's all right. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't yeah. yeah. So uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you for your uh, thinking. Is, and I'd like to thank the organizers for the, everything. Um, I was thinking that, I mean, I, I, I was looking at uh, Father Thomas's questions, and I find them really interesting because they're focusing on beliefs, practices, and there's a role of uh, prayer and the arts. So I'm thinking the social sciences and some people in philosophy have this have these categories of social imaginaries, which I find incredibly useful um, for a number of reasons. On the one hand, and I, I mean, is they might be useful in terms of peace building, 
And the reason why I say that it's because they allow us to remember that our um, ways of understanding things, our concepts are contingent. Uh, they can change, they're adaptable, they're improvable. So they, they include this sort of ingredient of intellectual humility that I like. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because when it comes to theology, I think it's vital. Uh, and when it comes to peace building and negotiating and mediating, I think it can be a very, very useful tool uh, through which ideas can be looked at. So I'm, my contribution would be just not, I don't wanna point at a, a specific belief or a specific affirmation or a specific practice, but I would just say that understanding or looking at our contribution as Catholics through the lens of social imaginaries might be interesting because in a way, in a sense, they encompass theoretical approaches and conceptual uh, ideas, but also uh, how those ideas can sometimes be effectively laid in it also has to do with identity formation, uh, social practices, and thus religious practices. Um, that's the first thing that I'd like to say. Um, and the second thing would be uh, precisely in that sense, we could look at people or groups within our church and understand that sometimes the clash is not necessarily between ideas, but it's sometimes between imaginaries. I'm Colombian, and in the case of Colombia, for example, I believe this has been a strong clash between a pre-Second Vatican Council imaginary that has to do with just war theories, and then on the one hand, post-Second Vatican Council uh, imaginaries that have to do with peace building. This is just an idea to, to do that later on, but uh, it's just to give an example of how it's not Catholics versus non-Catholics, it's not about religious people versus non-religious people, sometimes it's even within our communities, and uh, that, in a sense, can uh, diminish our efforts in peace building. I'll just leave it there. That's a, just wait, and that's a fascinating comment because I mean it gets to that kind of the the labeling and and how so many of our uh, conflicts are internal. You know that 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 they're not the traditional ones. You know, across denominational sectarian bounds that we we would traditionally have you. You have different allies that you never would have thought of in past years, past centuries. Um, and, you know, we all, there's that, someone has, has uh, talked about the, 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 the dominance of game theory. This is all about winning. It's all about point scoring. And that's the way we do it. Um, I want to go to Bob Driver Bishop. Uh, Bob, you had a comment you want to say about Rodney Stark's uh, research, I think? Yeah, just some background. 40 years ago, I was um, probably the highest level possible for military intelligence, Russian desk. And it was at that point, um, I was motivated to seek out peace. Um, I have master's and doctorate level with the Jesuits um, in specifically transforming organizations and people's lives. And I'm really struck recently by Rod Stark's book, Bearing False Witness, which talks about the ways um, Historically, the Catholic Church has been misunderstood for its contributions to society, but most specifically, he points out, and in other scholarship, the role that monasteries played, particularly between the year 500 and 1200. Uh, the Benedictines estimate there were more than 60,000 monasteries that helped lift civilization out of the dark ages into what we have come to know modern society. It was not on the back of the Renaissance. If you really pay attention to the scholarship Rod Stark is doing, and he's with the Georgetown Peace Center. So, I mean, there's, there's that connectivity I would encourage you. What I've done is a deep dive into the monastic life and much of that's been forgotten about. And what I have found fascinating is they dealt with both the macro and the micro at that time. Helping transform the individual helps transform the community. And I think to work on both ends is very important because when we become humble, when we realize our own humanity, I think it provides a bridge that we can better understand, connect with others. And, you know, I, I've got this scholarship and I've been testing it in congregations. And what I've noticed is it enables an increase in generosity. And I'm not just talking about giving, giving's gone away, but it's generosity of spirit towards others and towards themselves. And as we proceed with it, seeking peace, 
I think it's this reconciliation is the starting point. Um, individual reconciliation, group reconciliation, and then it's able to expand into the community and beyond. So I just encourage mm -hmm. looking at Rod Stark, but if anyone wants to know or work with the research that I've been doing, I'm more than happy to share because we have to work together on this stuff, my friends, and thank mm -hmm. you for providing this forum. Meg or Tom, do you wanna to speak to that? I'll just pick up on one of the many wise things that Bob just shared with us. Thank you, Bob. Well, one of them was uh, early on, you said, uh, I'm wondering if it's, uh, uh, if peaceful people come first or a peaceful culture produces peaceful people. There's the chicken and egg question that I've been asking for about five decades now. <laughs> And I don't, I've never come up with an answer. Uh, uh, simultaneous movement on both fronts. Uh, a peaceful people and a, a culture committed to peace. And as Bob's later comments suggested, with the right tools, the right toolbox to um, maybe uh, to, to, to characterize human history as a story of at least potential peacemaking, as opposed to inevitable and variable uh, a conflict. We, we want to get away from fatalism, uh, and I ha I happen to agree that many uh, of the of the uh, Christian cultural and theological sources do kind of just throw up their hands and just kind of give up and say, well, it's going to be conflict all the way down, and uh, any reconciliation is, and ultimate peacemaking is going to have to wait till the other side of history, the other side of the tomb. So we need to resist that. We uh, and I think Bob's comments shared a lot of wisdom about what is possible, especially if we think our way into new ways of acting. Can um, I just add yeah, the, yeah, the rise of civilization, which just recently came out? Anthropological studies show that we are not oriented towards violence, as was assumed, but we are seeking out better ways of working. I'm sorry to interject, but rise of everything, a fascinating anthropological study of our origins and how that impacts our world too. I hope that's the case, Bob. Um, I look around at the headlines and it's <laughs> it seems a lot, of, a lot of contrary evidence to that. I want to jump uh, real quickly to Cesar Villanueva. Uh, Cesar, I can't find you. If you could unmute yourself and ask a, a question. You had a good one about, um, I think, about base Christian communities. Uh, hi, Beast from the Philippines. I have a very bad connection, so I cannot do my video, but my question is what happened to the basic Christian communities that the churches have been forming for so long a time. Uh, they were in my country, they were the entity, they were the cultural group that can speak truth to power and can speak peace to the dominant paradigm that impinge or the, on their own development. And uh, I think Developing a culture of peace also starts from the fact that uh, my belief that uh, the peace of the other is my peace is our peace together. Thank you for that comment. That's a, an excellent one. I think that also kind of ties in. I've been thinking about that a bit myself as well. The fate of those communities because you know they're so uh, it's basically synodality in action in, in so many ways. I think Megan. Well, and it also is a place where. Right, we have Catholic examples, we have resource for synodality, for developing these communities. And I mean, unfortunately, at least in the, the English speaking world, they never really, I mean, in the US, they never, I don't make, they never took off. Um, and there are, you know, many, many political reasons that could be investigated for that. But it's, you know, I mean, I saw that there were some in, in existence when I was in Nairobi. I know they, you know, they they continue to exist throughout Latin America. Um, I know they have existed in the in the the Philippines. I think what'll be interesting as we think about what does it take to build a culture of peace and what David that might look like with a culture of synodality. Um, I think this is a place where um, communities. In, in the global south that actually did really have vibrant based communities, um, they seem more prepared for synodality than places like the United States. And I also would just throw in, I think it's key that, I, I think it was, was it Tomas Halik had a, talked about the civic element of synodality. We talk about synodality as simply a purely ecclesial thing, but again, it's, 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 it, it isn't that interstitial tissue in a sense 
that connects what we're doing here to what we're doing in the church, which is building, modeling these forms of, of, of community. Cecilia Nicoletti. Thanks. Uh, I'm Cecilia Nicoletti from Caritas Internationalis. Uh, I just want to bring my experience, uh, my pastoral experience, um, uh, which I do with migrant uh, kids, youth, and uh, their families in very, very difficult uh, suburbs uh, of our city of Rome. Uh, as I wrote in the chat, uh, in our pastoral and artistic experience in these popular quarters of Rome, we found that fostering non-formal educational paths and initiatives of participatory art um, can give uh, the possibility to uh, to this youth uh, to come together uh, to share their different religious and cultural uh, values uh, um, experiences uh, and we gave them also a central role in our communities uh, we gave them an agency uh, to contribute even through art even through participatory art uh, to uh, peace processes uh, and uh, uh, through shows, through labs, uh, through this kind of uh, participatory art, which involves an entire community, uh, we could achieve to uh, to have uh, to to change conflictual context, conflictual suburbs, conflictual popular quarters uh, into very peaceful and inclusive environments. So uh, what I propose even to church institutions uh, uh, from the local level up to the diocesan level and the national level is to, uh, to foster more and more this kind of uh, uh, participatory art approaches, which include not only Catholic people, but people from different cultural backgrounds, uh, even non-Catholic, uh, non-believers, uh, uh, which uh, uh, can share then human values with us and contribute to these uh, peaceful processes. Thanks. Thanks, Cecilia. I think that's a that's a superb observation. Is that something we've talked about trying to get going, even you know, in the Bronx and, and other places connected to Fordham? Um, uh, uh, Cesar, you just wanted to have one quick follow up qu uh, comment. Yeah, we talked about synodality. Uh, I'm involved in the Philippine Ecumenical Peace Platform, the widest and the broadest. Uh, peace network in the Philippines of so different churches from the ecumen being ecumenical that means the Catholic Bishops Conference that's the um, National Council of Churches in the Philippines that's the ecumenical bishops forum that's the Association of Majors Religious Superior it's a very unique body that has been accompanying the peace process between the government and the Communist Party and here we what I noticed is there has been a movement from a culture of denunciation, uh, which has been the, the, the culture in the past in the anti-Marcos dictatorship uh, era, to a culture of proclamation, to a culture of solution, to a culture of transformation, seeking solutions to conflicts on the ground. So I, I, I just like to share that because I think there's, there's a lot of potential in creating it. My, my other last point is this. Uh, my guru in peace work is Neil O'Brien. He was a Columban missionary here in the Philippines. Some of you must have read his book, Revolution from the Heart. His dream and, and, and ambition has always been, how, when can we bring back peace building in the church, in the seminary formation, in the formation of our uh, clergy and in our women religious? Because it's neither in any of the formation program, unfortunately. Um, Meg or, or Tom, about the Tom. I'll simply add uh, my voice to agree with Cesar's point that our traditional, I, I worked for over 20 years in uh, uh, formation, seminary education. Uh, I was lucky to work in Jesuit context where there was certainly support for all aspects of Catholic social teaching. That was my job description, as well as peace building. But I would have to say, I think I share Cesar's concern that a typical seminary, especially a diocesan seminary in whatever part of the world, is not necessarily uh, uh, prioritizing these 
uh, they're not against the values, but they just haven't prioritized it in the curriculum and emphasized it enough. For example, making a course on Catholic social thought or on peace building a required part of the curriculum, that's been something that's all too rare. So I share that uh, concern with Cesar. And I also just want to underline uh, he and Cecilia and, and several others, the most recent comments in the last five minutes have lar largely made me think of how much positive energy is coming from the grassroots, whether that's, you know, local based communities or Christian life communities or uh, small ecclesial movements that are being heard in this synodal process of Pope Francis, uh, but all too rarely heard in the wider church. The, that's where the value of peacemaking seems to bubble up. <laughs> doesn't come top down all that often. It comes bottom up. So Cesar, Cecilia, and others, I certainly agree with these observations about the uh, hope coming from the grassroots, right from the bottom up. I would just uh, uh, direct people to the, the chat. There are a lot of great comments uh, that have been posted here. Um, one quick question I wanted to, to raise is Roberta Davis uh, asking about the, will the church rescind the doctrine of discovery, uh, which she says helps set the stage for animosity and violence between cultures. That often comes up in, in discussions that we have. And, and I wonder if that's a, um, you know, Meg or, or Father Tom, if, if that doctrine of discovery formally rescinding that is something that could make an important, be, be a truly um, uh, constructive step in peace building by the church itself? Well, if, here's the tricky thing. I have not, right, so I've been in a couple of situations where there's some sort of conversation um, among, one of them was not, um, was with indigenous communities who themselves were not Catholic or Christian. And one of them was a large group of indigenous Catholics from a bunch of tri different communities in, in a particular situation. And in both cases, right, somebody has brought up um, and actually brought some sort of formal petition um, asking us to, to pass it along to people in the Vatican about the doctrine of discovery. Um, the actual, and I, before I was trying, I'm not skilled enough to kind of look up information while on a Zoom. I tried before. Um, Right, the, the actual content, like the papal bulls are not in effect. Um, they were, and actually not very long after, um, right, overturned by subsequent papal bulls, the, the 14, is it 53 and then 93. Um, however, an overwhelming amount of people seem to think that they are still valid in terms of the church. Um, and even worse, they get, and this is a particular situation in the United States and Canada, they've been referred to by legislation. So you have Supreme Court cases in the US that have referred to these papal bulls as if they are in some sort of legal effect. Um, and so it, I understand when church leaders say, but these things aren't in effect anymore. They have in a right, like basically were rescinded and overturned. The problem is, is that the way in which, right, like we do this with, you know, another amendment kind of logic um, hasn't changed the imagination of peoples and it hasn't changed. And I don't just mean that hasn't changed the imagination in terms of, um, of, the imagination in terms of our relationships within and the feelings of indigenous communities, but they haven't, the, the fact that there are cases from, um, I don't know of any from this century, but the last where, where the Supreme Court um, would reference it, particularly um, with respect, um, particularly when it shouldn't have any force in US law anyway, um, it is a problem that Honestly, um, it is an imagination problem. Like we need some sort of big formal thing, I think that actually makes clear that, that not only are we apologize, we need, we need to admit the depth of the mistake and they haven't done that publicly enough. I think that's a very good explanation, Megan. I, I like that a lot. Cause again, this comes up quite a bit, but also I was thinking in terms of this and also connected with our wider theme. I mean, the, the Pope, Pope Francis, hopefully his knee willing, uh, can travel to Canada to make the that uh, apology to the indigenous 
communities there over the residential schools. Those kinds of, I mean, uh, you know, there's the formal renunciation of the doctrine of discovery, but all, but as much as anything, changing this narrative, changing this, you know, that, that a meeting like that and a personal going there, um, a sense an act of reparation, if you will, seems like it would be as important as anything. Yeah, I agree with that, David. And I'm old enough to remember the year 2000 when Pope John Paul II made, it, it was, uh, a series of statements that amounted to apologies. It was uh, mocked as the apology tour uh, by those who didn't uh, approve of a Pope looking uh, humble and vulnerable and apologizing. But I, I thought it was really important to go on record in a definitive way, as David's uh, previous comments suggested, and just wipe away all the ambiguity. No, we're not we don't know. We no longer believe in a doctrine of discovery that takes away the rights of indigenous people. And maybe a trip to Canada, if Pope Francis's knee heals enough to do it in the coming weeks, that might be a, a propitious time. I'd just like to go, Kelly Johnson. Uh, I can't see you, but if you you've had some good comments in the in the sidebar and a couple of questions, if you want to unmute yourself and ask one of your questions. Sure. Hi. Thank you. Um... Yeah, I, I dropped a note in. I was actually just writing something about this for another purpose um, with information that's taken from the Amazon Senate documents about the Vatican's understanding about um, gender versus and the, and the document discovery. So that's in the chat. I, the question I wanted, while we've got this wealth of people here who know so many things going on around the world, um, I think in terms of cultural change, one of the challenges is that, you know, we, we hear a lot of talk that what appears to be apathy is actually a psychological defense mechanism because people are just overwhelmed and feel um, helpless or depressed or angry because they can't fix, they can't make themselves innocent, they can't, right? So we all these walls go up. And that the thing we need to do is to help people to find a place um, within their emotional tolerance <laughs> where they can um, get some kind of constructive hold on things. And the thing that's really grabbed my imagination is the need for widespread training in skills of nonviolence. So conflict transformation, dialogue skills, bystander um, intervention, even organizing for demonstrations, whatever, but, but um, making that available. And, um, and I'd love to see this, this is my dream, to see this institutionalized um, in Catholic education, in Catholic parishes, so forth. And I wondered if anybody had um, experience or knowledge about something like that going on. I think, I, I mean, I have enormous sympathy with the interest in connecting liturgy and ethics. It's been a longstanding thing in my thought, but I'm also aware that people come to prayer wanting quiet because the world is so full of conflict. And, and so it seems to me um, breaking that barrier in a way that people can encounter conflict without feeling that their sense of what they come to church for is violated, right? And that that seems to me to be something that that just requires training in skills that, you know, there are experts out there who can help people do that. So that was my thought. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a terrific uh, observation. Anybody? Um, I... In Kenya, the International Movement of Catholic Students have a program in Mombasa where right which is essentially peace building and conflict resolution training in high in secondary schools um which then you know is a, a restorative justice kind of structure and that's for anyone who doesn't know that's the part of kenya where there is strong um conflict between muslim and christian um communities um so i think i mean that's one of the things that i've learned is that uh, the most promising of these kinds of things i've seen are are come out of the international movement of Catholic students, pro, you know, the, the things that are, right, like organized by, by youth groups and ICMICA, they're the student arm of Pax Romana. Um, and so that's, that's one place where I find hope and I'd say that there are some really cool things. I, I got to learn about the one in, in East Africa, um, but there are really cool things that, that they're doing in terms of developing peer-led student trainings um, in, in Nonviolence and conflict resolution and restorative justice. Um, 
I would also just, just want to read a quick uh, comment from Mike Klein, who, who isn't able, his audio and video uh, aren't working. So the spirit of reconciliation is central to peace building. And yet in my work with indigenous communities, it's clear to me that the path to reconciliation is through truth telling, relationship building and justice doing in tangible ways. Then when the people harmed are ready to decide for reconciliation, we may begin the specifics of that work. That seems so uh, very on point to what we're doing. Um, Meg, one other quick thing I wanted to go to and both of you is, um, you know, we're talking about the specific uh, Catholic spirituality, the motifs of Catholic spirituality, um, moving from something like the doctrine of discovery to the Good Samaritan, the tale of the Good Samaritan. I'm just struck, Pope Francis returns to that again and again. I remember when his, his message for the World Day of Communications a few years ago, which is always a time to talk about how we communicate. He used the parable of the Good Samaritan, communication without words, as the what he wanted us to remember. And that seems to be what we're talking about here, is it not? So I want to share, I'm going to share my screen um, or attempt to at least, well, where did it go? Um, and that is, we'll see if it works. Can everyone? Yep, it works, good. Okay, so the, the thing I like about the parable of the Good Samaritan and why I think that Pope Francis is right to take it and put it at the center of our theological imagination on social ethics. And it's not something that we often put at the center, right? We, um, I do Catholic social teaching. We usually go to Matthew 25, right? We usually go to the Beatitudes. We don't usually center the parable of the Good Samaritan as how we think about systems and structures and society. Um, but what Pope Francis has done is he's taken taken the parable and what and put it at the center and used it as the frame for Fratelli Tutti, which is all about how do we build a culture and and societies and one big society that is grounded on social friendship. Um, and so what I what I put up is what I show my students, which is um, John August Swanson is a, a Caribbean artist, Van Gogh, right? You have all of these different cultural representations to help um, one's imagination think about the parable of the Good Samaritan. And what I think is powerful and why I think it's a good starting place to build a culture of, of, of peace building is because unlike other, um, other passages, other texts we use, it's not fundamentally about us, them, and the way we usually construct things. Then the parable of the Good Samaritan uh, positionality is fluid. So Francis, Pope Francis is asking us to think about where we are in the parable and acknowledging that at different moments, we are different people in the story. We're the priest and the Levite. We're the Samaritan on the side of the road. I mean, the wounded man on the side of the road. We're the Samaritan walking down, making the decision to, to stop and enter into somebody else, else's path. Um, and that, that fluidity of recognizing that on, right, that I'm sometimes all of the people here makes it a useful way to think about not just that one-to-one. -one. I think it does come back, David, to your first point of it, it starts in the one-to-one, -one. Um, but also then how, how do we then think about groups of people and how we're communities? But I, I think there's a real powerful powerful imaginative tool by the fact that um, it's not two dimensional, it's not one directional. It's not like Matthew 25, where Jesus is asking, when did I see, you know, when did I see you hungry, Lord, and I did not feed you? The parable of the Good Samaritan is much more dialogical because we're not always, right? It's not just being asked a question it's where are you in this story and where are you in this story today? And where were you in the story yesterday? And that's a much harder, much more um, challenging in terms of our own moral complicity. And I wanna say that Kelly's point about being overwhelmed is, is quite important. And, and I think that's where narrative and stories and what, what the Pope's doing with the parable of the Good Samaritan 
kind of helps us build narrative tools to engage things that are just fundamentally overwhelming. Those are wonderful insights, Tom. And I'll just add that the response, so the Good Samaritan in Luke 10 is Jesus's response to the question, but who is my neighbor? And so we have Pope Francis, as uh, Dr. Clark just said, returning to that story, that narrative over and over again with all of its valences, she unpacked it very well. Um, to answer the question, who is my neighbor? And of course, Francis's response is a global response. Uh, I, I have uh, talked about him in writing, actually, as the primary voice for a cosmopolitan ethic in our times, a voice against ethno-nationalism that limits our understanding of who our neighbor is, the scope of our moral obligations. So we can stand with Francis to stand up for a cosmopolitan ethic that knows no bounds and recognizes our obligations to all. And the link to peace is just uh, very briefly, it's about reconciliation, a theme already explored in our conversation. We need to be reconciled to all people and not just the ones that we choose of maybe of our nation or uh, linguistic group. So uh, a, great, a great theme to invoke at this point. As uh, Stephen Duvall put in the, in the chat, uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan is an antidote to the politics of identity. Um, I also think it's, um, you know, it's uh, uh, perhaps an antidote to to despair. Which, and again, that that a sense of oh, that really resonated with me. That sense of um, uh, uh, overwhelmingness that, that that Kelly talked about. That um, uh, that I think you you see when you talk to so many people. Uh, Father Anthony Spadaro, uh, Jesuit advisor to uh, Italian Jesuit advisor to Pope Francis, tweeted the other day about that despair that leads to apocalypticism. He said that the triumph of an apocalyptic way of thinking on the right as well as on the left, in the West as in the East, in Islam as in Christianity, is the end of thought, the end of diplomacy, the end of the will to solve problems. And I think you know, in our context, in the in the U.S. experience, you know, apocalypticism uh, can be such a powerful, dominant theological and cultural motif. You see that with the eco anxiety. With that, when we talk about culture, about that that movie, don't look up. You know, if I don't want to be a spoiler, if anybody's seen that, but uh, my my teenage daughter had to run out of the room in the in the middle of it. Is that helping or is that? Is that hurting that kind of that kind of cultural framework that, you know, is, is the world going to burn up in 30 years? David, I think part of the problem is how do we have a broader sense of history? Um, and that right, part of why people are so overwhelmed, part of why there's such panic in terms of young people's, you know, I mean, they're, they're, we know that there, this environmental anxiety is, is something that's uh, not just don't look up, but I mean, it was a major storyline in um, the HBO series, Big Little Lies, right? Of children, right? Having essentially panic attacks, learning about climate change. Um, and that's right, like this isn't out of nowhere, right? The author's not getting it out of nowhere. We know this is happening. Um, and I think it's twofold. I think on the one hand, we currently are suffering from, and, and I think it all circles back to intellectual humility. Um, we, we suffer from no attention span. Um, and so not, right, nothing really gets done. And, and our young people see that. And they, it's not, you know, they have no faith that we will actually do what we need to do in order to save the planet. Um, because they're seeing no evidence that we do, that we will. Um, they see no evidence that the grownups in charge actually, with power, are actually doing and prioritizing the things to make sure that they have a healthy environment to live in. And it, it's ties throughout all these conflict questions, right? Because we're seeing the same thing domestically with respect to guns right now, right? Lots and lots of young people who, when they see their response is, but nothing is going to change. I see lots of my friends who are parents saying, well, well, now something will change, right? Their kids say to them, 
and they can't bring themselves to give them any hope because they don't have it themselves. Um, and I think that's where spirituality can help remind us that we're, we're being asked to do our part, but we're not being asked to fix everything. Um, Father Jim Martin, once I heard him give a talk um, to about the magis, and he said he was corrected by an older Jesuit when he was working on the book, um, the Jesuit guide, that, that it wasn't for the best, for the greatest glory of God, because Ignatius didn't deal in superlatives, they're paralyzing. Um, this sense of that working for the greater glory of God doesn't ask perfection of us. It doesn't ask that we're the best. Um, and that, that, that leaving what is God's to God can free us to do what it is we can do. So I think, I think that's where that intellectual humility isn't about throwing up our hands and saying, it's not, I can't do anything, uh, but about freeing us to do that, which we can. Now you've also, you've talked about the, the difference between the secular and the, and the, and the Catholic um, outlook towards, um, towards uh, visions of hope and progress. And, and so much of, you know, what I've thought of as traditionally Catholic or Christian um, activism has been taken over by a kind of secular activism, which is wonderful, you know, find partners anywhere. But is there a fundamental, are you getting at something that's a fundamental difference on, you know, hope uh, between these two visions, between a whatever, you know, social justice movement going on there that is not necessarily religiously framed? If people haven't taken a look at them, I highly recommend Pope Francis's COVID messages it was, a, it was his Wednesday messages last fall uh, or in 2021. Um, and he talked about hope and he linked subsidiarity. Um, and now I'm blanking on the second one to, and the universal destination of goods as tied to the virtue of hope. The common good and human dignity were, to, uh, human dignity and solidarity were tied to faith. Um, the common good and, I'm blank, and the option for the poor were tied to um, the virtue of love and subsidiarity and the universal destination of goods were tied to hope. So there's this sense of hope in something, um, hope is being tied to our social life and the community and how, how we imagine who we can be together. I work with, when I, I start my theology of peace class with John Lennon's song, Imagine. And it's right, and, and I've got a bit of a reputation for ruining songs that they like to hear on the radio. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful, musically, it's a beautiful song. But if you stop and think about it, you don't actually want to live in the vision of peace that John Lennon is, or at least my students don't and I don't, holds out, right? Imagine there's no heaven. Imagine there's nothing distinctive about any of us. If that's what it takes, right? How do you have hope for a peaceful community if, if that's what we're envisioning? And so this, this sense of, and this is why, right? I started with this image of, of, can we imagine Pentecost? And if we can imagine living in Pentecost, then maybe we can actually imagine what it would be like to have a peaceful community in our, in our local, national, in our family, in our global context. Um, cause it's not right. The vision of Pentecost isn't let's get rid of all of our differences. It's let's embrace our differences and, and know that we can be, we can find understanding with them as opposed to eliminating them. Thank you, uh, Megan. And I just want to respect our time and I want to go to father Tom Massaro and just let him give us a couple of concluding thoughts. Sure, I'll tick off three thoughts, a sentence uh, to each one. I'm encouraged by these three aspects of our conversation. One, pluralism. Many of us talked about, even typed in uh, chat comments, about appealing to the broader group. Not It's not just an intramural Catholic concern for peace. Let's make uh, allies wherever. Secondly, conversion. We didn't use the word as much as I thought we might, but it's there. We all need conversion on the individual level and the societal level, and it's ongoing. It's not once for all. 
And the third theme, spirituality. Many people commented on the uh, features of a spirituality of peace. I even saw one about why don't we emphasize the sacrament of reconciliation more. I like that chat box. I, I do it uh, myself all the time. Uh, so let's keep in mind that third theme of spirituality and the way that the rest of the conference, so keep logging on to this conference the rest of this week and see how all those detailed prescriptions for strategies and so civil society groups uh, and peacemaking and disarmament proposals can be merged in some way with spirituality that undergirds all of those values. So that's it for me. Father Thomas Aro of Fordham, thank you so much. Meg Clark, St. John's Fordham graduate, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all to, to, to being here for this, uh, this terrific uh, session, Culture First, Shaping a Culture of Peace Building Through Spir Spirituality in the Catholic Tradition. I can't uh, sum it up any better in terms of giving us both a sign of hope and writing a new narrative, a new cultural narrative, which I think is also along with conversion, community, dialogue, is one of the great threads of this terrific conversation. Thanks to you all. Thanks to our hosts. It's going to be a terrific week. Keep, keep logging into these conversations. You all give me hope. Thank you. <laughs>